Thank you, Marcus, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, as has been said, I want to start off by thanking Kappas and everyone involved in it, um, the directors, Thomas and Robert, uh, and everyone else, especially concerning the lecture series, Teresa and Gregor, who put up everything so well here. And also, uh, thanks to my fellow fellows. Um, I agree with everyone else who said that, but I need to say it again because it's true. Uh, it's a really um, nice, inspiring place, and I cherish the discussions we have and also the time being together. Mm. My talk today is titled A Lecture on Fear of Breakdown, um, Psychoanalysis of Time After the End of Time, and you'll soon uh, get a hint of uh, what this is about. Um, what I'll be talking about is uh, situated within a psychoanalytic framework. And psychoanalysis is more than just a, a method or a treatment method to treat um, mental illnesses and people suffering from it, but psychoanalysis uh, follows um, what Freud called a tripart model. It's not just a treatment method, it also is a general theory of mind can have a psychoanalytic approach to all things mental. And the third aspect of that model is that psychoanalysis offers a methodology, not just to approach people suffering from mental illness and how to change something about that, but also to approach social, cultural phenomena um, that have to do with the human mind. Within this general theory of mind and within this methodology, psychoanalysis uh, focuses on the role of unconscious conflict, like different opposing motives that stand in opposition to each other, leading to something that is called compromise formation, like something that tries to balance out the different opposing motives who stand in conflict to each other. And another thing I'd like to mention is that uh, psychoanalysis um, talks about mental object relations. I put object in quotation marks because it's a Freudian term that's not so, well, handy. Uh, what is meant by that is the internalization of experiences we make in relation to others. We form an object representation um, within our mind about how we stand in relation to other people, how we see ourselves. And these two aspects, unconscious conflict and object relations, are pivotal for a psychoanalytic approach. So, that being said, uh, let's imagine a patient. Mr. Z suffers from recurring panic attacks. He keeps entering psychophysiological states in which his heart rate goes up, he starts to sweat and senses an overwhelming tension that feels like he's dying. So far, there aren't any medical reasons that could explain these states. By now, he has developed a fear of fear, making him feel even more tense and miserable. In terms of temporality and subjective time, we can see that Mr. Z suffers from something about his interpretation of present states. Like, what does it mean that my body feels this way right now? And what will happen soon afterward? So what he feels at present determines his view on the future. And in brackets, that has to do with his life story, of course. So in terms of temporality, psychoanalysis has done a great deal of research on that. Um, I um, put three major works on that slide. Um, and one thing I want to highlight, and that is the concept of après coup, um, that is usually conventionally used in French, even in German and English papers and um, books. Um, for example, by Jean Laplanche, but it goes back to a Freudian term Freud used to call Nachträglichkeit, which is a new word in German even. It has been translated into English as deferred action, which is kind of misleading. Then they try to translate it as afterwardness, but nowadays um, everyone uses the French term après coup. Uh, Freud develops that um, or illustrates it uh, through a case vignette of his uh, young female patient, Emma, who 
reports that as a young girl, aged eight, uh, she visited uh, a grocer's and twice, and men uh, working there touched her between her legs. And he didn't, she didn't have a strong emotional reaction to that, left um, the shop and, well, everything went along normal. But then she entered a different uh, grocer's uh, at the age of 12 and developed a strong anxiety reaction uh, when men were laughing at her and commenting on her dress without touching her. And what Freud does with this um, reports is that he argues that the second event at the age of 12 led to the first one having a traumatic effect in the first place. And it's more than just, well, looking back at things, we understand them differently. Uh, it's more than that in terms of that the emotions are felt only because the second event took place at the age of 12. And that's what Après Coup is all about. Something about the second event changes the way the first event has an impact. And that's not just part of a theory of trauma or mental illness in psychoanalysis, but in a general sense in terms of the theory of memory in psychoanalysis, like the logics of inner perception. Freud calls the consciousness as a sense organ for the perception of the mental, like looking at our own insights in a, a specific way. Uh, that's a general theory of uh, memory, but of course we can uh, use these thoughts on temporality to describe disruptions in temporality in mental illness, for example, in PTSD, where flashbacks play a role that also have to do with a twist in how past, present, and future are seen together in depression, where time and temporality can feel like chewing gum, like endlessly stretched out. In schizophrenia, things are scattered and shattered, and in generalized anxiety disorder, um, they are as well. Um, when you think of a person having a pessimistic view on the future and always thinking about uh, the worst things imaginable will happen to me and I'm not able to cope with them. Mm. If we dive into that a bit more uh, thoroughly, uh, we find the concept of fear of breakdown developed by Donald Winnicott. Um, uh, most prominently, prominently in a paper that has been published in 1974, a British psychoanalyst. And he describes something, uh, he calls fear of breakdown, and that has to do with uh, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic thinking, I think. He describes patients who report um, a sensation that feels like falling forever, like being in a state where there's no um, orientation, no emotional holding function by significant others. Um, so they, they keep being trapped in that state. Um, it also can be described as something people suffering from it describe as expecting a crash that actually has already happened before. Excuse me? This is ridiculous. So what you see here, anyway, is that something that happened in the past, people weren't able to mentally deal with it or represent what happened. So that accounts for a fear of that event happening in the future. And this, um, this thing, uh, Winnicott tries to explain by uh, the lack of representation of the past event. So one could say that the individual is situated in a post-apocalyptic state. There is something that has happened, like a revelation in apocalyptic thinking, and it's something about a time in between, in between the event that happened and the mental processing that event. And of course, psychoanalysis, in a cultural sense and also in a clinical sense, tries to deal with these states, tries to, tries to change something about it. And there we find another important concept of temporality in psychoanalysis um, developed by Wilfred Bion, another British uh, analyst, uh, and he calls that catastrophic change. And put it briefly, um, this concept is about the 
situation in clinical psychoanalysis where both participants, the analyst and the patient, go through some process of uh, mutual breakdown, so to say, in terms of emotions. Um, and Beyond's take is that there has to be an intersubjectively intersub felt breakdown as a prerequisite for breakthrough. I, as a psychoanalyst, have to get a hint emotionally of what my patient is talking about, suffer emotionally from a similar state to be able to help him overcome that state and thus uh, establish a different mental timeline. So I'll leave it at that for now. and start my lecture because my lecture today, my talk today, uh, is entitled Two Lectures on Fear of Breakdown, Psychoanalysis of Time After the End of Time. So let me just briefly give you an introduction about, about the psycholytic framework I'm about to use. Maybe some of you have already heard that Freud uh, described uh, like a three-fold tripod model of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is not just about helping people suffering from mental illness, but it also puts about a theory of the mind in a more general sense, like a theory of memory, a theory of trauma, and other things, not just mental illness. And it also provides us with a general methodology that has to do with um, exploring my own emotional reaction to something I want to study. That can be a patient, it can be cultural phenomena like strange lectures in a lecture hall, anything can be approached psychoanalytically. And through that, by that um, approach, uh, unconscious conflicts uh, play a certain role like wanting to stay in a lecture hall during the strange presentation and wanting to leave the lecture hall during a strange pr uh, presentation. And mentally dealing with these kinds of conscious and unconscious conflicts means to arrive at something that is called compromise formation, like staying in a, in a lecture hall and reading something else. And uh, alongside unconscious conflict, psychoanalysis is about uh, exploring object relations, like the way I have my mental representations of others, who I think of people listening to a lecture, the way I think about a person uh, talking in a lecture, things like that, like mental representations of what I expect of others, how I see myself, and also how I see myself in relation to others. So let's imagine a patient. Mrs. Y suffers from a major depression. She feels like she's worthless, others are worthless, and, they're, um, and that nothing but worthlessness is to be expected from the future. It's as if nothing good will ever happen to her and she won't be able to manage any challenges life will impose on her. Things are bad and will stay that way. There won't be any progress. Nobody could help her to get better or even like her. And in terms of temporality, here you can see something particular in terms of the way Mrs. Y looks at possible future events. Um, this has been called as a, a depressive triad. I am bad, things are bad, and the future is going to be bad. And of course, that has to do with uh, subjective, something to do with subjective time and temporality in terms of is there anything that could ever change about my relation to the world? And that's, of course, a big part of uh, depression and uh, a burden for people suffering from it. Um, we can take a more thoroughly, thorough look on what that has to say about temporality. Um, here you can see some major works of psychoanalysis in terms of temporality. Um, I want to highlight what uh, Jean Laplanche, following Freud, has to say about après coup. Freud um, used the German word, of course, Nachträglichkeit, which is a new term in German language. Uh, due to various uh, difficulties uh, in translating that term into English. Um, nowadays, we arrived at using the French term, uh, even in other languages. 
um, beginning with Freud, Nachträglichkeit means that some later event leads to a former event having an emotional impact. Like maybe some of you have heard about that case vignette Freud used um, in terms of the young female patient Emma who suffered uh, like uh, um, inappropriate um, being touched by uh, older men in a grocer's uh, without um, reacting to that emotionally much at the age of eight. Only later, at the age of 12, when she was entering a different grocer's with different men in it that didn't touch her between her legs like the first one, but laughed about her, her manners and her dress, then there was the, like the nachträgliche emo emotional reaction to it, like the traumatic event uh, that the former one was had its impact only because the second event happened. And that's not, not just part of a theory of trauma, but also of general memory theory and psychoanalysis um, in terms of Freud describing the consciousness as a sense organ for the perception of the mind. We can uh, talk about this in terms of general theory of memory, but also in terms of disruption in temporality in mental illness. Um, you heard something about depression and how time and temporality, subjective time, can be described as some sort of mental, temporal chewing gum where you have the experience that you're stuck in it and nothing will ever change. In schizophrenia, things are fragmented and shattered. I had a patient who once told me that, she, that he used to uh, be a sailor with my parents 300 years ago which is not really true as far as I know my parents' backstory, but it shows that time and subjective time has a different impact on the mind in schizophrenia in that case. And also in generalized anxiety disorder, uh, patients suffering from it uh, describe very often um, that they don't feel like being able to cope with anything the future has in store for them. We can dive into that uh, a little more using a concept the British psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott brought about. He talks of fear of breakdown, and by that he means something very specific. He means the subjective experience of being uh, afraid of a dangerous event happening um, all the time, like people describing the, uh, being in a state of falling forever, like expecting a crash, expecting hitting rock bottom, but that... This is ridiculous. Excuse me? This is ridiculous. Okay. In terms of temporality, that has to do with something that happened in the past, a, a traumatic event, overwhelming event, but people weren't able to mentally process it. So being in a state of falling forever means being in, in an in-between state, in between an event that um, had a huge impact, an, an impact that is that overwhelming that it can't be mentally represented or stored. So due to that, it comes to the state of uh, feeling like falling forever and expecting a crash that has already happened in the past. So if we link that, link that to uh, apocalypse and post-apocalypse, um, one could say that these individuals that suffer from a fear of breakdown are in a post-apocalyptic state, in an in-between state between something like a revelation and the remaining time until the end. In psychoanalysis, we don't stop there. We don't tell patients, well, okay, you're suffering from a fear of breakdown, that's bad, it has to do with your history, but we also try to change something about it or help uh, patients change something about that. And we can resort to a concept put uh, about by uh, Wilfred Bion, British psychoanalyst, and he argues that it is the mutually felt emotional breakdown in psychoanalytic psychotherapy that helps a patient to get better and to overcome that in-between state. Catastrophic change means that something disrup disruptive happens, like a person disturbing a public lecture. 
something catastrophic happens and that changes the way we feel about ourselves and uh, we deal with things mentally. So it's the interceptic, interceptic um, uh, the, the breakdown that is felt in between the couple of psychoanalyst and patient that is a prerequisite for breakthrough. And that can establish a different timeline in terms of what past and present and future have to do with, with each other. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, yeah, uh, could we leave the discussion um, for after the talk because I'm going to start with my talk that's called uh, Three Lectures on Free of Breakdown, Psychoanalysis of Time After the End of Time. Um, maybe some of you already have a hint about what a psycholytic framework could be and of course you know that psychoanalysis is not just a treatment method uh, that is it, it, of course, it's true, but it also brings about a general theory of mind and a general methodology. And that allows psychoanalysis to talk about the apocalyptic um, and other things, of course, cultural phenomena. And psychoanalysis, which is commonly known by now, uh, resorts to the role of unconscious conflict in that and also object relations. Um, like how we think about ourselves and others. What annoys us about others, how we get bored by other people sometimes if they keep repeating the same things. That also has to do, always has to do with your mental image of others or the, the mental representation uh, of yourself. You have like thinking about what am I doing here? I could have coffee uh, uh, during this morning. So, but let's imagine a patient. Mr. X suffers from a post-traumatic stress disorder. A few months ago, he was involved in a very heavy car crash on the highway in which both persons who were in the car with him got severely injured while he was left unharmed, physically at least. He even went back to work the next day. Yet, every now and then, images of the accident keep popping up in his head all of a sudden. Sometimes sudden loud noises make him flinch. Last week, he entered his car and started shivering without even knowing why. If we look at that case vignette um, in regard to temporality and subjective time, uh, we can see two important things. The first is the role of flashback, like past events and images of past events popping up in the present, disturbing um, everyday life and disturbing the present, and also flinching at loud noises, it, um, what happened in the past, like the traumatic event, also changes what I expect from the future. Even sounds being not very dangerous uh, evoke a strong uh, bodily and emotional reaction. So of course, traumatic events change something about the timeline a person lives in. Um, you can see here some major works um, of psychoanalysis I want to highlight, especially Enduring Time by Lisa Barreitzer, uh, which has to, do about, uh, has to do something about the role of waiting, passivity, And it, of course, it touches also on repetition, which is, as you might probably heard of, uh, a big thing in the role of temporality in psychoanalysis, like repetition. But also something, uh, Jean Laplanche uh, is an author who worked uh, a lot on that. Uh, you can see it's a French term in an English book uh, that has to do with uh, the term being used in the French version, even in German and English writings, and Spanish, as far as I know, as well. Um, it there were um, attempts to translate it that haven't really worked out. Um, the main thing uh, in the concept is that a later event brings a former event's emotional impact to life. Freud, in a very common known uh, case vignette, I think probably everyone in here has heard about that, uh, with a young female patient who suffered from inappropriate behavior by older men not reacting strongly to it, but later when something similar happened without 
the girl being touched inappropriately, but the second event had an emotional impact on her. That has been used in psychoanalysis for a general uh, theory of memory, like memory, describing memory not on a linear timeline, but in terms of circular time, things having an impact on each other in both directions and in a more complicated way when it comes to emotions that are involved in it. So the logics of inner perception is what um, is touched here. Uh, Freud also described the consciousness as a sense organ for the perception of the mental, which has to do that our consciousness is something that has mental aspects as its object. We can think about ourselves, about our processes, and these thinking processes can also be disturbed, of course. They can be unconscious, they can be disruptive things like that. And there, of course, uh, we can uh, think about disruption of temporality in mental illness. You heard something about PTSD uh, already. Uh, in depression, we have a different timeline, a different, like, different way of how time proceeds in the mind uh, and uh, how things are felt. Um, so people suffering from dep depression and uh, suffering from generalized anxiety disorders often describe a view on the future that is very pessimistic. Um, only bad things will happen. I won't be able to cope with anything, with any challenges that lie in the future because I'm, well, I, I don't trust in my capacity to deal with something. If we dive into that a bit more thoroughly, we find a concept by uh, Donald Winnicott, a British um, psychoanalyst, that described uh, patients who reported uh, a fear of breakdown. And by that uh, concept, uh, he establishes through that, um, he describes people suffering from the subjective ex experience of falling forever, that is linked to a lack of emotional holding function in the past most prominently in childhood, like being in, in, in an in-between state, a state that feels like falling forever. Like you can maybe imagine that someone falling off a rooftop, but not yet heavy, ha having hit gr the ground, like the in-between state between the fall and like the crash. Um, and the important thing about the concept is that Winnicott describes this is about expecting a crash that has already happened. People already fell off the rooftop and it can't be remembered that there was this fall. It's just the subjective sensation of falling without knowing um, that there was something that initiated the fall. So if we link that to our thinking about uh, apocalyptic thinking and post-apocalyptic thinking at Kappas, one could say that what is described through free of breakdown is a post-apocalyptic state, a state in between uh, a revelation that has an impact that um, is responsible for things not being the way they were, they were before and uh, the end of time. In psychoanalysis, we want to leave it at that, but also uh, try and help patients to deal with these states better. And um, that can be described along the lines of another British psychoanalyst, Wilfred Bion, as catastrophic change, which has to do that it is something in relation to others, in relation to your psychoanalyst, that helps you to, um, like to, to escape that state of frozen time or shattered time or in-between time. So um, that something about that is felt intersubjectively, um, these breakdowns. Uh, that is a prerequisite for breakthrough in psychoanalysis and for change, not only uh, in the individual, but also in larger groups and societies. So establishing a different mental timeline is what is made possible by this. So I'll leave it at that and start with my talk. And it's called Three Lectures and a Conclusion. You already heard the three lectures, so now we can come to the conclusion. So what did just happen with you? Um, a lot, probably. Um, and I want, what I wanted to um, highlight by the repetition, 
And maybe you noticed that there was not a, an exact repetition in different parts of the lecture, um, is um, to make you feel something about the role of Nachträglichkeit uh, about Apricou. Because I hope that the first lecture kind of guided you through the second one. The fact that you heard things before made you feel or made you understand a bit more the second time you heard it. It was very dense what I presented uh, in the slides. So maybe the second time you heard it, you, I hope, you thought, oh, okay, now I understand that a bit better. And that's pretty conventional, right? If we read a book for the second time or a scientific paper, we get more about its content than in the first time. And that's not so surprising. The, the, um, maybe the most uh, important, more important thing is that it also can be seen in the different direction. That the second time you heard the lecture changed how you remembered the first time you heard the lecture. Like there were different things, like the, uh, the interruption of the lecture, when you had heard that the second time you already knew, okay, that happened before, it probably was not just a nasty person, but maybe it has some performative aspect to it. And also, of course, uh, concerning the things I was talking about. Um, so it's, what I'm trying to say is there's two directions. Um, the second time you understand more about what I'm trying to tell you, but also it changes how you remember the first one. So <clears throat> what, I'm, what I was trying to make you feel is um, practices of nonlinear temporality, like the to and fro aspect of the first and the second, of course also the second and the third time you pretty much heard the same thing. Um, that is one aspect to it. Um, you, you were uh, suffering from Nachträglichkeit uh, yourself, in a way. But what I was also trying to um, make you experience or feel is the part where self-reflection is a part of psycholytic method. Like the way we are kind of pulled back into our own reflection about how do I stand in relation to something I'm hearing or something I'm experiencing. So um, that has a lot to do with theories of change and insight in psychoanalysis because um, these, well, these are gained through uh, experience, not just through teaching or explaining. Um, and also, um, that's pretty common probably that you learn more easily or um, the things you learn stick to you longer if you experience them. In psychology, um, there's always experiments uh, how you learn uh, languages more easily. So it's hard to learn nonsensical syllables and to remember them. It's easier to learn words that have a meaning and it's also easier to learn words that have a meaning and are connected to images or experiences. So that's also the case in psychoanalysis. But um, what I was trying to do is to take that a step further and to make you like feel a mini catastrophic, micro catastrophic event. I didn't want to someone to, to destroy something in the room, but have someone interrupting the lecture like a micro-catastrophic event that um, changed your perspective on the lecture so far. So maybe there was some sort of catastrophic change in you through uh, that. So, um, but the conclusion uh, also has to do with, uh, well, saying something about what that has to do with temporality. Um, some of you know that in part already from yesterday's uh, group presentation, but I want to highlight the role catastro catastrophic change plays in, in that. Um, in that. On that slide, you can basically have a, see a model about um, the different sides of temporality in a patient entering psychoanalysis. Um, there is past and present having uh, impacts, having an impact <coughs> on each other, 
what happened in the past also, influ of course, influences how someone views uh, the present and himself in the present. And uh, in a patient entering psychoanalysis, that is probably largely unconscious, especially when it comes to difficult emotions. But also, of course, uh, we have, oh, this doesn't work, we have the different direction. Uh, the present, like the way we feel right now, has an influence how we look at the past. You probably have a different view on your past when you're angry at present than you have when you're joyful. So, <clears throat> and in a patient's mind, you can also see that there is some sort of anxiety towards the future playing a role uh, in how someone views the past and the present. Um, and that anxiety, for example, in depression, blocks and influences our view on the future, like coping mechanisms, um, you heard that. And also, how we see the future, like pessimism, negative expectation, influences the present. I don't feel well if I think anything that is about to come is bad. So this is something that um, leads to a person suffering from symptoms of mental illnesses. And what is happening then in uh, psychoanalysis and among other factors through catastrophic change is that uh, something is established that another British psychoanalyst, Dana Bergstedt Breen, calls reverberation time. Like a, a mode of temporality that is not just linear, and, but also not just like a vicious circle of negative views, but something where the past and the present and the future like reverberate into each other or onto each other. And in that state that is established through um, psychoanalysis or self-reflection and through catastrophic change in a, in a way where something, where, where heavy emotions are felt in relation to your psychoanalyst, for example, we also have past and present having an in impact and influence on each other, of course. How, what else could be the case than the past, in a way, determining the present, but also the other way around. But you have a patient that is not so much blocked by anxiety in terms, how, in terms of how she or he or she views the future. Um, that is not to say that everything is bright and shiny in the future but there's some sort of different mental capacity to endure um, uncertainty about the future. Of course, future, there can be bad things happening in the future. There can be another big interruption in the lecture, of course, who knows? Um, but at the end of psychoanalysis, or in the end of mental self-development, so to say, uh, we have uh, more openness and also more, well, uh, trust into our own capacities to deal with apocalyptic events in a sense. So um, there's a multitude of futures. And uh, that is something I so far and will continue to uh, explore uh, in uh, my CAPAS fellowship. Here you can see some works um, I'm working on or have been working on. Um, under the, the header of living in the Anthropocene, like the understanding the role of uh, the end of time for the Anthropocene. And um, I'm going to conclude with uh, two more thoughts um, that these uh, different micro-studies have in common. And it is about um, analyzing crisis, of course. And I'm going to say a few words about what that can mean. Um, using a psychoanalytic framework with all the aspects uh, I talked about is a means to analyze crisis, of course. Um, there's method methodological things uh, we can derive from that. Um, so, and through that, uh, develop a framework for a psychoanalysis of crises and apocalyptic states. Um, and some parts in that framework concern temporality, especially the fear of breakdown you heard about, um, and also the role of self-reflection in crisis or apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic state. Um, and self-reflection always means uh, reflecting upon self-other relations. 
um, analyzing crisis in that way would also mean that through felt catastrophic change, we are able to mentally, not only mentally represent the breakdown, but also come to terms with a different future um, and some, some breakthrough that is gained through feeling a breakdown state. Um, and also, of course, you might have heard about that unconscious aspects uh, play a role in that, and uh, that is what self-reflection can lead up to. But that's only one half or one part of uh, the relation between psychoanalysis and crisis. We can use crisis as an object we analyze, but psychoanalytically approaching crisis would also mean to understand crisis as something that un analyzes us, that not only leads to us changing something about the world, but also the world changing and the world in crisis changing something about ourselves. So crisis can also be like the subject part in the figure of analyzing crises. It's crisis who, does, who do the analyzing. Crisis itself, from a psychoanalytic perspective, can seen as a means to reflect upon ourselves. Um, it not just gives us like the challenge to deal with crisis, but also um, change our, our perspective or our self-reflection. And that's not only the case for, for someone as an individual, but also for groups, nations, or for humankind altogether. Crisis as something that we can't escape from in terms of change we do within ourselves. Um, so crisis themselves can become an analyzing agent provoking self-reflection. And this time I'm going to really leave it at that. Thank you for your time. <laughs>